Welcome to the Days of Noah podcast, where we talk all things biblical, supernatural, and strange. Today we're going to continue our discussion on ancient elongated skulls, and then move into some of the technology that was used to create megaliths, and how that relates to the understanding of resonant frequencies, the power of words, and how this technology would have been used to cut and move stones, as well as how frequencies affect life, our cells, and the world around us. As I was looking into this this week, I did a Google search, just a simple elongated skulls uh, search, and I swear the first 15 entries were um, debunking. There there was more debunking uh, entries than um, I could find of actual open-minded searches or experimental, um, not necessarily experimental, but... Yeah. Uh, just searches. Right. Yeah, so they were largely in favor just saying that cradle headboarded over and over. Yeah, that that was the uh that was the thing that just kept coming back yeah. over and over. And was it like forum groups or articles? They or news? They appeared to be more so articles. I only read a I only read one and then looked at the titles of the other ones, uh, because I didn't want to spend all my time, you know, researching why it's you know, why people think that it's not true. It's largely just being dismissed, right, out of hand. Oh, I I totally agree. And they aren't looking at, you know, we went over the kind of the bullet points last week, but just just for a brief recap, you have the sagittal suture missing, you have larger cranial mass, you have up to 50% larger eye sockets, um, the jawbone is different. The form of magnum where the spinal column comes in is about an inch off. Um, then there's these little bones in the back that Derek Olson talked about called the Inca bones that our skulls don't have. And the volume inside of the skull is, a lot of people say 20 to 25%, uh, but I recall L.A. Marzulli saying up to 40% when he did a test. So he had a regular human skull, he filled it with rice, and then dumped that out into a container to measure it, did the same thing with the elongated, and there was 40% more volume. Yeah, you can't, you can't get those types of features. Those are, those are things that people are born with. And, um, and I believe on episode 132 with uh, Blurry Creatures with Derek Olson, he mentions it, I think it was in Iran where they where they found these skulls, but some of them were infants, so you wouldn't have had the time to do the head boarding or binding. Um, they had them right out of the womb, apparently. But yeah, I don't know. What did you think? Did it did it make you skeptical when you found all that stuff, or you were kind of like, huh? I guess I would have been a lot more skeptical back in uh, 2019. Yeah, um, but. <laughs> given given the date, I I think that uh, there's more of an open mind on my end for you know things that are just out there and not necessarily mainstream. Right. Yeah. Given the climate that we're in and the suppression of information and just the way the the mainstream tries to control narratives. Right. Yeah. Makes you skeptical of the main. Things that are said. One thing to add in there on the control of narratives, um, is it possible that governments are trying to keep that from people so people don't freak out and, um, you know, cause panic and things like that? And more so than not, people would probably lean more towards aliens than they would uh, towards uh, giants, uh, Nephilim. Right, right. Something that they can put in a, a framework that they've been sold for a long time with movies, Hollywood, and now, you know, the ancient alien show, all of that. And on top of it, outside the Bible, because that's not looked at as a good source. Having a 
I'm going to say ungodly, non-godly uh, explanation for origins of things. We can explain it away in, in different naturalistic ways. Yeah, I, th I agree with you that I think there's so much to what, what are they trying to push, what are they trying to hide, and then also if you have all of these physical features, you can't account for it with the headboarding. You really can't. It's it's just too it, there's too many things. But some questions that I thought of for the first people that did headboarding, who would have been the first and why? Like, just imagine a time in history where it was never done, the headboarding, and then somebody thought of it or somebody taught somebody to do it, and why? Like. You know, imagine you're the, you're the head of the household or something in whatever BC. Hey, honey, I think I'm gonna do this uh, next month when uh, when little little Joe pops out. What? <laughs> like, like how how did he bring it up? You know. So I mean, it's talked about a lot about emulating something else. They saw something else. You know, they're the elite class, the rulers, the gods, or 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 naturally, we were saying, a naturally elongated skulls, people that had these features, you know, wouldn't they be scared of their children's health? You know, that they're going to do this. Like, you're going to do what to my child? You know, and just think of the mother instinct, right? Uh, why would other family members be okay with that? Who taught them? Did they have to do trial and error? One of the Blurry Creatures episodes, they were talking about, like, pharmacia, you know, um, sorcery and drugs and, you know, wild mushrooms and stuff. And, like, did people really just go around and start popping these things in their mouth? Like, m most of those mushrooms that kill you, you know, it, it makes you think, like, someone probably had to teach them this knowledge. They wouldn't just go, oh, that looks good to eat. One thing that we were uh, discussing um when it comes, to, well, just now, when you were talking about who came up with the idea, um, there's always, I think, people coming up with strange ideas. And um, I think one thing that the show was leading to was the emulation of something that they saw. I think that we you had talked about that already. Mm -hmm. And um, and also, uh, a thought came to me about the, the sagittal uh, sutures. Uh, is it possible... And I know the frame and magnum portion kind of throws this theory off, but is it possible okay. that the uh, um, the cradle boarding pushed the sutures together, causing them to disappear? Is that possible? Um, however, unlikely due to the the theory of the frame and magnum and the balance of their head versus their body. Yeah, so just the idea that it would have changed how these things are formed. So... I think at first glance it's plausible, but then I wonder if if you took a baby right out of the womb, do they already have that? So maybe that's maybe that's worth looking into. And they do. They do. Okay. They do because the sutures allow their heads to form like a cone so they can be birthed. Birthed. Okay. Yeah, right, because of this, the softness of the of the baby's skull. That makes, yeah, that makes sense. Right, but you, but again, like you brought up, it doesn't account for a lot of the other things. You aren't going to add cranial mass by just shaping something. You aren't going to increase the volume uh, inside the brain cavity. Or add the Inca bones either. The Inca bones, yeah. the... Um, the eye sockets being much larger. Let's talk about the eye sockets uh, real quick too, because, and again, I don't want to uh, paint too broad of a brush and say these were of the giants, although there seems to be a relation there genetically, because a lot of these elongated skulls were on, you know, five foot, six foot people. So nothing out of the ordinary in their stature. But some of the discussion on on giants and living underground and being in caves they have very pale skin a lot of times um and it's thought that they had basically night vision um and i wonder too if that's 
some uh, is a is a feature of uh of these the orbital um increase is like 50 percent bigger um yeah maybe there was something to do with their site that was enhanced it could even be something as uh as simple as uh, the way that animals see in the dark with the uh, ref- right. reflective um, um in the rear pardon me the rear of the eye is has an, a reflective yeah. how should i say that maybe we'll just bail on yeah that right no now. that's good well one of the things dealing with uh I forget you, you, you cited them off quite well on all those different features. Um, if they were to manipulate the suture, I think it was, is that the, is that the part of the, the skull that's open allows the, the spinal column and the nervous system to come up to the brain? That part is the foramen magnum. I believe but, for uh, Raymond. It was, it was one Raymond of them Magnum? that it was saying it was basically moved. Like it was in a totally different spot. Yes. Yeah, and about in an inch to, off. And in, in order to manipulate that, you would probably kill somebody. Out of all the features, that's the one that stands out to me because, you know, you're not going to kill somebody in the process. And how long does it take to headboard somebody? It was a good point you made about the infants. Um, if they're already showing that characteristic, how long does it actually take? And I don't know if any of those articles that Don was looking at, I know he said he didn't really dig into them, but um, I mean, I don't, I don't know. How many years would it take to, to manipulate a soft infant skull to get it to, to be pointed? Uh, I don't know. Well, when when a child first comes out, they'll have a cone head um, to a point, but then that goes away very, very quickly. And maybe they grab them right out of the birth canal and put them in whatever device they were using. So what is generally the age at which uh, an infant's skull begins to harden, right? Because you have to be careful with a newborn for how many months or, or years? First year, something? I I want to say six months or so, but that's getting into some medical stuff that I'm not too okay. aware of. I mean, it, yeah, there's a shelf Start, life starts, to that, yeah, right? Where the, where the um, where the skull is hardening, right? So, I'd imagine they would have to do this headboarding, you know, from birth or close to birth, and then for a period of months, but then at some point. You can't shape it anymore, probably, right? Because things are are setting up in place, like like cement, you know. I would I would imagine, yeah. Yeah, I thought we could move into some of the other things that were talked about on megaliths, um, technology, um, acoustics, resonances, frequencies, stuff like that. So, um, Derek mentioned on the show you know, uh, acoustic properties in underground chambers, um, possibly due to rituals to enhance their psyche. And did elongated skulls possess abilities similar to that due to their anatomy? Maybe there was something, uh, sounds or or frequencies or resonances that they were able to create just, just by their anatomy, anatomy. Um, and he mentions uh, one of the giant tribes in the Bible, Zamzumin, uh, described as talking gibberish, and um, I think noisemakers or something like that was another term used in some historical uh, writings. And then, of course, the Josephus quote about the giants: "Terrible to the hearing." So there's there's some seems to be some sort of um, acoustic qualities or some abilities that these beings had. When when you're talking about gibberish, um, I guess we would have to go a little bit further for me when it uh, comes to the different languages. There's tribes in Papua New Guinea that speak in very strange uh, sounds. Um, there was uh, a missionary to Papua New Guinea that um, we support, and he is a language expert. And he actually uh, spoke a little bit in the language, and um, 
I'll uh, I'll give it my best <laughs> shot here real quick. But it was yeah. like it, he he was using sounds like you know just clicks ve- and very stuff. very strange very strange and um, like that movie um the gods must be crazy do you remember that one where they where the coke bottle falls out of the sky that's the only part i remember that <laughs> yeah but i think it was i think it was like that it was like little clicks yeah but again when when you're talking about noisemakers i think that um you know and to to torpedo what i just said um, it's highly possible that um, people back then knew there was different languages, and to assign noisemaker was probably something um, pretty. Um, yeah, yeah. I just wonder if it connects to something like what Josephus said, where it was terrible to the hearing, like they just had, and maybe just you know, if you've got a ten or twelve foot creature, they they could probably. Uh, <laughs> bellow out something oh, that's pretty I mean, psycho sounding make it make an opera singer jealous with with how they can project oh yeah so, the the caves right the, the caves the psyche yeah because of the how those acoustic chambers carved out of ground um i think he called it it's called the oracle because of the way it just continues to echo through there so i mean that in and of itself just shows a a level of technology that they could they could do that. No, I was gonna I was gonna reference um one of the latest Blurry Creatures episodes had a first hand testimony of seeing a giant um when this this guy was he's forty two now, he was fifteen with his friend. And when they encountered this thing up in a tree, he said it was about fourteen feet estimated. Um he said that he felt it was hard to breathe, and when this thing laughed, uh, I forget how he described it, but there was there was almost like a supernatural power to its voice. One one thing I wanted to add when you were talking about rituals and sound and um, and the caves and things like that, the the old monasteries, the cathedrals would be built in ways that had, I don't know about the monasteries, I'll just go with the cathedrals, but they were built in ways that would enhance uh, the chanting of the monks and things like that. Mm. And maybe that was something that had been learned from uh, the the people who were talking about. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good point. Speaking of monks, um, did you happen to check out that one video on... on the YouTube link I sent you, um, talking about moving stones. Did you see that one? No. All right, that's an emphatic no. All right. <laughs> well, I, I saw I saw the one about the the words and the the apples. Okay. Yep, that was one I made long long time ago. Yeah. So um, check that out when you get a chance. But it's um, so. Graham Hancock and Randall Carlson on Joe Rogan mentioned this too, talking about um, there are ancient writings, I think they mentioned Egypt, talking about how they were able to move things and cut things with sound. And um, so that kind of dovetails with this video that I sent you. That so, I didn't watch, yep, so my, yep, that's okay. my apologies that's on that. Okay. So I think it was in 1939, and I forgive me, I don't recall the name of the of the person, but he went overseas and observed, yeah, a bunch of monks standing in like an ark with instruments. Some of them had like horns, some were banging drums, and like 60 meters in front of them, they had like this big slab of rock. It was like a, a meter by a meter and a half, they said. So this guy from the West, he was observing this. And they're blowing the horns, playing the drums for several minutes. Nothing's happening. And they had this, the slab was set in like a, they had carved out like a bowl for this to sit on. And yeah, after a few minutes, the stone begins to rise. And then like in a parabolic arc, it rises up into the air and there's a, there's like a cliff face, uh, they said was about 250 meters high, 
with an opening, like a cave opening cut out. And stone after stone, they said five to six per hour, they were lifting up into the air with sound and setting on this ledge. And that is just fascinating. So Randall Carlson and Graham Hancock talk about that same kind of technology. Well, it's it's also, I believe, was mentioned in this uh, podcast as well with uh, Jericho. Oh, exactly, yes. Yeah, that was one of the things I wanted to get into, too, is, is to, to kind of talk about how does, how does the Bible, either in actual events or just in the language it uses, talk about the power of words, power of frequencies. Yeah, so Jericho, you had, well, they had to, they walked around the, the walls for, for seven days on the seventh day. Did they do it seven times on the seventh day? Yes, and then uh, then they were given the instructions to, and I believe that the podcast said, blow the horns, kind of in that fashion, and uh, everybody shout. And, I mean, we don't know what those horns were. Um, they were probably uh, ram horns, but who knows? Shofar, something yeah. like that. And uh, the walls came tumbling down. Yeah, so you have, um, I mean, it's it's like one of the first scientific, things you you kind of learn as a kid is like if a opera singer sings a certain note she can he or she can crack a wine glass right so that has to do with uh, the inherent resonant frequency of that object um i remember my my buddy when we were building a recording studio years ago you know he'd bring up We'd be, you know, hit a note or something uh, through uh, on a guitar, played through an amplifier, and we'd hear like the wall or the desk or something vibrate. Oh, yep, we're hitting the resonant frequency of that piece of drywall, or that piece of wood, or whatever. Well, and and people, people who can't hear anything, um, still can enjoy music based on the vibrations and the and the, uh, well, I guess the vibrations and the frequencies that it's caused by. Yeah, was it um, Bach that went deaf and he was still composing by like laying his ear down on a on the piano? Was that I or Beethoven? Beethoven. Beethoven was. Beethoven. Yeah. Beethoven. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I think I think there's a lot to what um what sounds and frequencies I mean just a, the overly quoted Tesla quote is the secrets of the universe are in energy, sounds, and vibration, or frequencies and vibrations, rather. Um, so um, one part of that video, too, they were talking about actually destroying cancer cells with frequencies. That It took them months to figure out the exact frequencies, but it was a low frequency and a high frequency simultaneous. On the eleventh harmonic, and once they found those two tones, and then that what they would do is they pulsed it because I guess if you, if it was a constant tone, uh, you could cause damage to, you know, the cells of the body because they would, like a microwave, it would heat up. So it was it was just a pulse. It was on off on off, and uh, and it was the resonant frequency of. Um, different cancer cells. Well, and you have ultrasounds that are are used to to break up the uh, kidney stones. There you go. And yep. um, ultrasound in and of itself can bring a picture. Yeah, which is interesting. Yeah, that's a good segue, Don. To um, cymatics, uh, which if you've ever seen a video of like a, a metal plate connected to a speaker or put near a speaker and then they'll dump some sand on it and every tone i mean just kind of go up you know 400 hertz 401 402 just i mean on and on they make an a symmetrical geometric pattern i think that's just fascinating god made you know frequencies to have a visual geometric representation that reminds me of the uh the game back in the day, the uh, this was more of a vibrations thing, but uh, the football game with all the players that are moving around 
I know that. Oh, ha- <laughs> I had that. I know how that has not much to do with what we're talking oh about. Oh my gosh, I that had game to, was so fun. I had to add it. <laughs> Kids today have no idea that thing. Yeah, you, sh- you shoved a nine volt in there or whatever, and you're like hoping your little vibrating character makes it to the end zone. <laughs> Well, yeah, you have your you have your energy in the nine volt, and that uh, trans translates to vibration, which causes the most <laughs> interesting game ever created. Probably. Oh man, some of those games are just fantastic. Yeah, so there's, you know, there's there's frequencies that can do damage, frequencies that can even heal. Um, I'm just starting to get into looking into that but certain frequencies that have a beneficial effect on on the body on pain relief um yeah taking care of disease things like that um one of the tests they did with frequencies was on MRSA which is you know like um antibiotic resistant pretty much and then they were able to to use a frequency that made antibiotics work so it weakened it enough that it worked um yeah let's let's look up a few uh bible verses about uh words um and see see what we can find um i know just kind of off the top of my head like you know jesus even being called the word made flesh and then right at the beginning of genesis and god said let there be light and um, I think it's Michael Tellinger, when he was on Blurry Creatures, he was talking about sound actually being able to move faster than light. And light can't exist without frequencies. Like that's, a, I think he said the light is a, a symptom or a byproduct or a result of the frequency. Um, I and yeah, I think there's mysteries in a lot of these Bible verses we just kind of take at face value and go, oh, yeah, he, he spoke it and made it. Well, he's God, so obviously. But I think there's like, I think there's mysteries of physics and just the order of creation that he made. Well, and, and to add to that, when you're talking about words, words are frequencies. They're, dif- they're, they're different um, patterns and they're very powerful because... You can take those frequencies, make them into whatever word in whatever language, and you can actually hurt a person emotionally with that. So, I mean, how far do these frequencies reach? Yeah, exactly. So that was, uh, and that's that's a good point, and and another good segue into. Again, you want to talk about do a Google search, and and everything will debunk it. But um, Dr. Masuro Emoto, um, I believe Japanese um, scientist, who discovered that there are effects on water based on different frequencies, different types of music, and even different types of words, positive words like love and thank you versus, you know, I hate you and you're you're garbage, things like that. And he threw... um, microscopic photography photographed how the water would crystallize um i obviously i think under you know freezing the water to make it crystallize like into a snowflake and when it was certain types of music beautiful music classical let's say or positive words there would be these amazing symmetrical geometric snowflake like crystals and then the negative words had just a very chaotic garbled crystal formation and then another thing he did further than that was to experiment with with food like like dumping rice into containers and then adding some water to it and then like writing uh, positive words on one container negative on another uh, ignoring the third container and then after several weeks looking at the results and they're pretty astounding. I mean, I I sent you the videos of the ones I did myself. Um, I, you know, I didn't have a third control container. I just did one positive, one negative. I did it with an apple cut in half. I did it with um, fresh cooked brown rice 
hot out of the pan, put in the same type of containers. And I taped positive words like love and kindness, things like that. I love you. Negative words on the other. And it was night and day. The rice that had the positive words still looked like rice. It smelled like rice two weeks later, left out in the, in the ambient temperature. Um, and the negative word one <clears throat> was a yellow pus-like uh, color and just reeked. Um, the apple, the one half with the positive words. And sometimes I would, I would say the words to the container or just think them um, as often as I remember to do it daily. And then the, so the apple, the one half had about 10% of it was mushy on one edge. So I cut it down the middle and the other side of it looked like it was fresh. And then the cut flesh, the open flesh, you know, it was a little brown, but it didn't have any mold or anything. The other side of the apple was 90% mush. Like the whole thing was squishy. And there was a lot of fuzz <laughs> mold growing on that cut side. So just anecdotal, of course, but I've seen other videos, people recreating this. Um, and one thing I want to share for a, maybe a future episode, because I want to go back to it, is um, if you've ever heard of the, the late uh, Derek Prince, he was a fantastic um, preacher, author, um, evangelist, just a wealth of, of good teaching and knowledge. And I think it was on his, his talk on um, blessings and curses. And he was talking about how he literally had seen, like dealt with, I think, in counseling or, or other settings, people who grew up in a household where they were told things like, I hate your guts, things like that. You know, it was just a very verbally abusive kind of situation. And they literally manifested physical somatic symptoms, like in their stomach. What? Well, yeah, I, I can, I can, I can completely understand that. Um, growing up, when there's, uh, well, I mean, all of us go through these periods of time where, you know, your parents might have some not so nice things to say to you, obviously because you did something wrong in a normal family, at least, or how should I say, a more um, a family that's a little bit more kind to each other, and you know, you're you're going to get a stomach ache. You know, especially, you know, from what you did, but then also after getting caught and uh, and spoken to in a way that you're not used to from um, your your parents uh, can cause major, major issues. And, you know, and I, I just remember my stomach would hurt really bad. Or even people say, you know, literally someone dying of a broken heart or in Revelation, uh, men's hearts will fail them for for fear. Um, yeah, so there's incredible power in emotions and words and thoughts um, that manifest physically. And I think that's just, it's a testament, not, I mean, some of this stuff sounds very new agey, but it's ultimately God's creation, like how he made us to work, how he made the physical world to work. Um, yeah, I think it's just, it's just fascinating. And, and it ties right in because we're talking about how are these ancient megaliths made. It ties right into a technology that was kind of lost. That's now being rediscovered. You can go on YouTube and see videos of people levitating little marble sized things with sound. And I think they do it not in the same way we're talking about with the ancients. They're doing it with like standing waves where it's like opposing uh, frequencies kind of set against each other. So it's a little different that way. But <laughs> some some of these structures that they built, like I'm, I'm watching um, a YouTube uh, presentation, a seminar, uh, where he's showing pictures of granite stone and it looks like it's cut on a lathe. It's it's so smooth, and it's like a curvature. And this is supposed to be, you know, in the Bronze Age, 
Like, how are you going to cut granite with that precision? Um, so, yeah, it makes me think, like, okay, you can get a bunch of monks in, a, in an ark and you can lift a, a slab, but what kind of precision tool would you need to make a laser-like cut? I know that they, uh, they cut granite with uh, water nowadays. Yep. I, I saw... I saw a uh, uh, a show on that a while back, but you know, high pressure water, and I wonder if you know if if uh, frequencies and I I I don't think frequencies work under pressure, but when well they do in a way I guess well, with the waves. I guess I guess they would because if if you look at just even decibels, sound pressure level SPL, so I guess it, there would be a measurement of pressure, wouldn't there? Yes. Yeah. Well, and and the the interesting thing about frequencies is that, you know, when you're when you're talking about like certain um, certain ways of communication, we communicate all day long with frequencies, mm-hmm. all day long. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, yeah. If you said to somebody a couple hundred years ago, before, um, I think Marconi is the one that gets credit for rate for radio. But I think it was. I think Tesla actually discovered it before him. But anyway, well, wasn't there wasn't there a a, a, a part of a, a song just uh, Jefferson Starship said Marconi? So that's got to be what it was. <laughs> okay. Well, then that that confirms it then. Yes. But yeah, if you said to somebody in I don't know the 1700s, let's say that you know it's possible to say something or transmit language hundreds of miles they go well wait a minute if i yell at the top of my lungs it's only going to go you know a mile or something like they would have no concept of like radio frequencies being able to be sent and picked up deciphered yeah and translated back into translated back and, and i think the thing that really amazes me is that the sound the sound of someone's voice uh is accurate through these frequency changes so right. it's not just like some sort of a digital recreation. Right, yeah. Just even, even what we're doing now, like capturing our voices on microphones, like <laughs> just translating well, that into something digital. Well, like like Pete has the uh, the midnight DJ voice, and I have the uh, high <laughs> high nasally tone. Oh, well, uh, you got to get up on the mic a little bit closer. You get there. That's going to help. A oh, little bit. now that's now Don sounds like he's yeah he's on coast to coast now. Yep. Yeah. And I think, too, going back to like Dr. Emoto's experiments with rice and water, I mean, think of how much water makes up everything, right? How much of our bodies, how much of the earth. And then um, even, well, I was going to say oxygen as a part of H2O, but that, that's that's another another thing as far as how, how oxygen affects things. But um, yeah, just water being able to be affected by frequencies by emotions by sounds um and god made all of this technology into his creation that's what i think is amazing and as we're talking about ancient technologies things that sound new age things that sound like occult or witchcraft which a lot of them are you know where's that dividing line between where it's it's unethical or an abomination to God, and I and I think as we're, if we were to explore that question, it's kind of about how something is supplanting or counterfeiting um, where our worship goes, where our adoration goes, where our, our affection and attention goes, um, and and we can we'll hopefully talk about this in a future episode about. Um, wandering stars and astrology and how you know the ancients were able to interpret things from the heavens um but god made these technologies to work um and i think that's one of the reasons why humans have a tendency to get pulled away from god because they are seeing things that actually have legitimate uses you know uh, someone gets into witchcraft and their spell works 
you know, either demonically or, or some other force of nature that they're tapping into. God says, don't mess with that stuff. It's a counterfeit. You don't know what you're messing with, you know, and, but it's not to say that these things aren't real. And I think that's the appeal as we look at like how many times we see Israel going after other gods. Like we just slap our forehead like a V8 moment, right? Oh, I could have been worshiping Yahweh. Mm -hmm. But (laughs) But, at the same time, I think um, we do, we do the exact same thing. In different ways. And in I, different ways, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and that's that's a question, um, just to bring up the idea of idolatry. Um, Tim Alberino makes the distinction uh, very succinctly. He says, idolatry is a very specific thing. It's not, oh, I'm I'm too into football, or, you know, I'm I spend too much time playing video games. Like, I think we kind of spiritualize it, and... I think there's something to that, there, like where our affections go. But I also think that there is, yeah, a literal, where is your, where is your devotion to? Um, and Mike Heiser gives a good example from scripture about that. Um, I, I don't have the reference off the top of my head, but it's where in the Old Testament there was a a pagan priest or something like that who saw the power of God and he wanted to take soil home with him because he knew that part of his job was to go into these temples and do these rituals. But once he had seen the one true God, he wanted to literally take holy ground with him and bring it back yeah, that's that's one story I've never heard, and I wonder if it's not just contained in a s- small set of verses mm-hmm. that just doesn't jump out at as much. Uh, Naaman, let's see here, Second Kings five. Why did Naaman want some of Israel's soil? So let's look this up. So okay, Naaman was the commander of the army of the king of Aram. So this is in Second Kings five. He was great in the sight of his master and highly regarded because the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Um, So I'm going to skip ahead here. Okay, it was Elisha, prophet Elisha. Is he the person that Elisha told to go into uh, into the river to clean off like seven times? Or was that a king I think he was talking about? Yes, it is. Elisha, Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan. Yeah, and he's like, I thought you would have done... Oh, here, I'll just read it. I thought you would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord and wave his hand over the spot and cure me. So he's he's upset at the the method of being cured. But he goes and does it anyway. He gets cured. Yeah, really, I, really I should just refer to... Uh, Mike Heiser's, um, it's got a short video on this. An altar of earth you shall make unto me. Let's see here. Naaman requested some of Israel's soil to follow verse 24 of the 20th chapter of Exodus, where it says, You shall not make me gods of silver or of gold. An altar of earth you shall make. And, And Mike Heiser says, um, I guess there's a verse, uh, I'm not finding it right now, but <clears throat> where he asks Elisha, will God know that I am devoted to him, even though I have to go do these, as part of my job, I have to go do these rituals. And where I was in a roundabout way, I'm trying to get to this idea of of allegiance. So, so the idea of idolatry being allegiance, where we all have our sin issues, we all have our things we do too much of and not enough you know, time with God or loving others, but there's something very specific about idolatry being a conscious and continual allegiance to something other than God. And I think that's, again, that's where the... Um, the allure of other gods in the Old Testament is very evident when you think of the Genesis 6 event and 
the things that the watchers were teaching mankind and all of these different types of corruption that happened you know it wasn't that oh i i, I like the look of your your little gold statue there i i think i'm going to worship that instead of the god that literally just saved me out of the red sea you know from the egyptians like it doesn't add up unless you realize that these gods had power that they were small g gods and that there was something alluring about it it wasn't just made up so when god says there is none like me he's not saying there's no other gods he's saying there's no one literally like me like i am far above these things but there are other things and that's inferior worship to any of these other things. Well, one one thing that I would bring up, though, is, um, and I don't know where the verses are, but uh, God does say, I think it's in Hosea, where he says you're worshiping idols of stone and wood, and then they can't breathe, they can't talk, they can't. So that might um, change that idea a little bit Mm -hmm. however uh however when it came to allegiance and this is where i might go a different way on idolatry um when it came to allegiance the the people when they got out of egypt when they made the golden calf they wanted to be like all the other uh uh, peoples around them because Mm -hmm. they had gods that would go before them in war when they traveled and when it comes to the calf it doesn't necessarily say this in the Bible, but were they worshiping or trying to worship Yahweh God through the calf or, you know, I, I don't know. And that would be an allegiance issue. But obviously the way that they were celebrating that day was nothing uh, to do with uh, Yahweh God. Yeah, so were they trying to incorporate Yahweh as just one of, of many? Because they came out of a polytheistic system, right? for hundreds of years in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I wonder if, like, you know, Moses is up on the mountain for all these days, and they're just getting antsy, and they're like, well, Yahweh was, you know, (laughs) it's like the Eddie Murphy thing. What have you done for me lately? Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. okay, Yahweh, yeah, you did that with the plagues and the Red Sea, but, you know, it's been a week here, so we're going to, we're going to, we're going to check out, we're going to make this calf, invite an entity to inhabit it, you know, something real, not just an object, but but they something that they think can give them results. Like you said, going before them in battle or something. Well, and and I have to bring this up because it's actually kind of um somewhat amusing, but when Aaron is confronted about the uh making the golden calf, he he basically says they gave me the gold and I put it in the <laughs> furnace and then out comes this calf. Out comes this calf. So he kind of left out the part where he uh, crafted it. Yes, it just happened. I don't know what happened. I <laughs> I plugged it in. I I tr- I pushed the buttons, and somehow it got microwaved. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think it's really fascinating just the just the modes of of creation that God used to create things. He made all that tech as part of his creation. It's definitely interesting. Obviously the the underlying supernatural elements, technology, we got the natural, we got the spiritual. Most people think of like Genesis when God spoke and things happened. They, I don't know. It's like if you were to be able to be there and see what took place down to the atoms I mean, it's God creating atoms and then causing those atoms to form. It's it's kind of wild how how the Lord did it, but He's He's all powerful. He's the creator of everything. And uh, you brought it up a second ago. The enemy that's trying to deceive us is all about counterfeiting and deception. So if there's something in the natural that um, or in, in, in the positive sense that God created, and this is the way he does things, 
the enemy is going to use another, maybe maybe try to duplicate it or to deceive that, hey, I have similar power, you know, I'm, I'm doing it this way. Um, was it Mike Kaiser that was talking about um, the, the plagues of Egypt and specifically some of those first plagues, like the serpents? And then, you know, what happened to Moses' staff? You know, it also came into to looking like a serpent, it was moving like a serpent, and then, hey, we're it's going to swallow your serpents, you know? It's kind of a, a statement there that, like, not only can I duplicate what you just did, but mine is greater. So, I don't know. It's kind of interesting to look at it from all, a lot of different angles. Um, I agree. And this side of eternity, we're not going to have it all figured out. But there definitely is an element of this that God created and for whatever reason the technology was either lost or just God didn't want it maybe it's part of the fall the fall of Adam you know um in in causing things to be more difficult um for for humankind God almost like gave us an amnesic response like i'm not going to allow this technology to be passed on Hmm. because i don't want it to be passed on that's part of your punishment and then if if the watchers are like you know i forget you god i'm we're gonna be rebellious we're we're gonna we know what you you did technology wise yeah we we want to pass that on you know and it's 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 a ploy it's a ploy to get their end result, you know, which is ultimately idolatry. It's, it's goes back to the original sin, you know, you're trying to crave somebody else's devotion and worship from focusing on the one true God to me. And that's what Satan was trying to, he he was jealous of, he was full of pride of, he was, it's like who is this this image of this man this this Yahweh this he didn't he thought he should be in that position he should receive all that devotion right and yeah, um, and, and he didn't I want think, to be I a servant it, either no he didn't want to be a servant anymore i think one other thought i wanted to to mention too is and this kind of goes to like what's the depiction in pop culture, in media, in movies, and fiction, of evil, right? It's some shady-looking character, you know, in the dark with a, with a, just a bad look on his face, when really evil is, is a lot more crafty and more alluring. And then another way to think of it, too, is how does evil flex its power? It, it often does appear as, something really strong, really dark, really powerful, you know, whether it's like dark, heavy music or, you know, an artist painting a picture of a, of a scary creature, you know, there's a, there's a sense of, of evil is always like flexing its muscles saying, look how strong I am. And here's God you know, infinite multiples stronger coming into the world as a as a baby. You know, the lamb willing to go to the cross and be slain. And just the incredible restraint of power that God has. He doesn't need to prove himself. And I think the counterfeit of Satan is always trying to prove to humanity just how enticing and powerful and 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 strong and magnific- magnificent are the the wide path that leads to destruction there's so many paths and they can all be very alluring and they can all have power but it's it's in that flexing of power where they just kind of flaunt what they have and god with that still small voice you know, if you're willing to accept his truth like a little child, that still small voice, and seek after him, you'll find him. But he doesn't 
he doesn't show off a whole lot, you know, compared to the counterfeit ways. You're, I, I think that was good points, uh, Pete. Um, I'm just kind of reminded of Elijah when he was waiting for the Lord. And he thought the Lord thought the Lord was going to come in a whirlwind or, in a, you know, just all these powerful methods. And it was it was the soft spoken word that shook him to his core. Hmm. And and even Jesus's words throughout the Gospels, he he rebukes uh, the fleshy, carnal minded individuals that weren't willing to accept with simple faith what was right in front of them and he and he rebuked them and he said this perverse generation is always desiring a sign it's always a, always desiring you know in the flesh and the enemy they form an alliance so that's why it can't the flesh can't be redeemed it has to be crucified it has to die daily yeah not until we get our glorified bodies. Uh, we have the spirit of adoption now, but but the actual adoption in our glorified bodies, then we'll have we'll have a, a redeemed flesh. Just this picture in my head. So okay, so think of you know wide is the path that leads to destruction, narrow is the path of life. You know, no one comes to the Father but through me. Jesus said. So. I don't know, I, I've had this image in my head for a long time of, so so you guys know kind of how the word sin is unpacked, right? Missing the mark, like someone taking an arrow, taking aim with a bow and arrow at a target and missing the mark, okay? And I think from that, I had this thought years ago, <clears throat> look up at the vastness of the sky and someone taking aim randomly at Straight above, you know, different angles. How many different ways could this arrow travel through the air or land? Infinite. Like you could do it a thousand times and it would take different trajectories every time. You know, minute differences maybe if you were trying to shoot it in the same spot. It would still be minutely different path through the air. And I think in my head, that's a picture of wide is the path of destruction and all of the allure of Satan's ways and exalting man and neglecting our creator is like shooting an arrow in every direction. And here's this one target that he's given, and that's through Jesus. And that is the way. And it just... To me, that just like sums up how all of the world religions and all of whether it's secularism or atheism or agnosticism or a counterfeit religion or a pantheism of just adding God into one of many. You know, you can craft any infinite number of ways and it's like shooting an arrow just randomly in the sky, but God has that one target and in his grace he's given us that one way and i would just i would just uh add that god himself has to shoot the arrow for us well that is a talk in and of itself <laughs> my friend yes sir we could get into that another time but uh yeah so thankful for for god's incredible creation of telling of his uh, his goodness and his ways and um, and yeah, thankful for you guys just being able to talk. This is awesome. Hey Pete, so kind of kind of on that end point, dealing with salvation, yeah, or or another way to to look at it is we're out of the family, we're out of right relationship, we're out of God's presence. Because it's almost like, and I think we've said it in previous talks, there's almost, I wonder if God has a book, you know, mm -hmm. is it written down anywhere or is it just understood by 
the by creation that and maybe not us maybe not adam and eve these r rules that are in place right so these rules that are part of uh good and evil part of 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 the nature of things the creation of things so it was like 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 you would have a law in a state or in a country and if you did it a certain way you did something a certain way there's punishment but if you did something else that's not an infraction you're safe mm -hmm. so it was like the enemy I don't know. God obviously didn't show all the cards because he was able to trick Satan with the lineage of his son, the birth of his son, even the death of his son. Because yep. if they would have known, meaning Satan and and the the ones with him, yeah, Paul says that, right? They would they would never they would. have crucified Christ. That's right. But it, so there was this kind of loophole, but it was still, it was only him that could fulfill this requirement in order to redeem us. Mm -hmm. And it kind of ties into, um, it makes me think of what Tim Abrino talks about, about dominion. And even when it talks about hybrids, right? That in order to have uh, authority here on earth, it had to be a human that would do certain things, mm. right? Yeah. And what did Jesus come as? And he was human. fully God, but yep. he was fully man. He was the second Adam. So he had, he met the legal requirements to check all the boxes and fulfill the, the mandate you know, of, of his father, you know, in order to get us back into the family. So it's kind of, it, it makes you wonder, did, did Adam and Eve know these rules? Were these things hidden from them? Um, or did they know tied, them after they was ate? It, was it tied to the, the tree of, 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 of the knowledge of good and evil? Right. And when they ate of it, maybe they had a revelation after the fact. It's like, oh, shoot. You know, ignorance is bliss. We should have yeah. stayed in the matrix, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. But, um, but they opened up that can of worms and they were ultimately disobedient. And it, it I know they talk about it on blurry creatures from time to time. Did it, did it actually change their genetics? Who knows? It's, yeah. I think there's a lot to that. Like as far as epigenetics and DNA and how, you know, iniquities are passed down. Like literally it's, you have a predisposition. Like we know that if you're, you have a grandpa who is an alcoholic, you have a predisposition. You have, you have a, a family me member that had mental problems, you know, depression or suicide, different, these things do carry on. I think there is some, some memory genetically in that. But I was going to say too, I think there, I think there are rules, you know, a lot of times when we talk about like spiritual warfare, we talk about like legal access that we've given the enemy through sin or, or other things. I think I think there are there's some sort of cosmic rule book that God has, and we we get a glimpse of that in the Satan uh, figure in Job, whether or not it is the Satan capital S, but in the Old Testament it was it was never a proper name, but you know, approaching God and saying, hey, what about Job? And God saying, okay, you can do this, but you can't do this. So there's there's some sort of give and take, and there's some sort of framework for, for how all of this all of this works. Um, I would agree with that. Yeah. And, it, and it seems like Lucifer being the smartest or the, the highest ranking of those that are fallen has a, such a high intellect in comparison to us mm -hmm. and in his own deception being the father of lies he's deceived himself that he can actually win you know yeah and he's or at deceived least other people you know 
So it's, but it's interesting that he understands some of the rules or maybe all of the rules that are available to his knowledge. And he's trying to, he's trying to catch God in a bind, but yeah, in a technicality, he can't, you know, he, he can't catch him, you know, that the whole process, he, God, God's set forth this uh, thing in motion in Genesis three, the seed of the serpent and the, the seed of the woman. And it was like, it, I don't know if that was the moment that the enemy was like, okay, he got a little revelation from, from God and it was like game on. So, uh, you know, and then you got Genesis six. So he's trying to snuff out pure humans. And then, so it's kind of just, uh, it, it, I don't know, it set, set things in motion, but it's kind of, Move and counter move, um, you see going on, and that's a L.A. Marzulli book, <laughs> right? Um, no, I was just gonna say because because we we Don and I we touched briefly, I think even on a, on a podcast talking about like how deterministic is God and and kind of how His sovereignty works. But even to that point, like here you have Satan with his minions and his plans, and then you've got all of mankind, most of which don't follow God. And it's like, here's God, like, sitting back going, do what you want. I'm still going to accomplish what I set out to accomplish. I don't have to control both sides of the chessboard. I am that much smarter and stronger and wiser than all of you, and even you, Satan, that I created higher than anything. I'm still... 10 moves, 20 moves, 1,000 moves ahead of you. And I'm still letting you have all this freedom to wreak all this havoc. And, and Pete, I want, I want to say it's... People wonder, it's like, well, why did the Lord... The Lord didn't have to create it this way, you know? Right. Why, Is this why, a plan why, B? Why, well, and I think it, it comes down to free will. He gave free will to us. He gave free will to the angelic sons of God, or as Tim talks about the elder race, you know, but um, ultimately what did God want? He wanted a family that would choose him out of their own free will. But in order to get what God wanted, he had, there's a byproduct. There's a byproduct that people aren't going to choose him. There's gonna they're gonna choose other paths, so it was like, I don't know, you know, God didn't God, God didn't create evil. Evil is a byproduct of free will. It's the opposite choice. It's the yin and the yang. You don't have that. If if that's the intent that he set up, you don't have that full picture unless you allow for the possibility for it to go whatever way we choose or the angels choose or so on. Like, he's still sovereign over it, and he's going to accomplish specific things, absolutely. But, yeah, there seems to be that that give and take of, yeah, I'm, I'm God. I, I could do all of these things, but I'm deciding to do it this way. Um. Yeah, that's that's a topic in and of itself, but um, it is. I, maybe we got off track. That's there. okay. No, a it's it's bit, but, uh, it's good it stuff. All ties, it all all fits together. It all fits end. together because yeah, people will look at the fall in Genesis and go, "What the heck, God? I mean, you, look at the misery of our world, and you're you're just gonna let these things go, and yet, no, there's." There's a contrast, too. Also, you talk about, you know, God being glorified, having the backdrop of sin and evil, and letting us kind of deal with our consequences of our own our own sin and, and how the world is. We see how good God is with that, that backdrop. And we, and we probably wouldn't see how good he is and how good goodness is without that backdrop, you know? Like... An earthquake happens in Haiti, and hopefully God's church, believers, come in and they 
bring aid, they bring food, they bring comfort. We are the hands and feet, we're the body of Christ. And in a lot of ways, it's like he's left it up to us in a lot of ways to show the world who he is. Because like you said, Luke, we have dominion on the earth. We are his representatives. So he does intervene, certainly. And he can do things unilaterally, but it does seem like the way in general that he's worked it out is, well, I couldn't do many miracles in this town because you guys didn't have faith. Wait a minute, Jesus is God. You couldn't do miracles? There seems to be some cosmic rules involved with faith and how open we are to God and what things happen on the earth. And yet if we go the other way, we, we close ourselves off, well, now evil is allowed to flourish. And, you know, a Hitler is allowed to rise to power. And he kind of lets humanity deal with that you know, to a certain degree. 